Deep in the heart of Borneo, a team of cavers and climbers break virgin trail, hacking their way through the jungle in search of the hidden cave passages of Ganung Buddha. Beneath the Earth's surface, they risk their lives for the sake of a passion, a primal desire to probe a world of shadows. Each twist and turn of the cave can hold a deadly surprise. Today we're going to journey to the third largest island in the world. For many, Borneo is the last frontier of wild jungle. It has not changed for millions of years. Beneath the jungle's canopy, a team of experts is charting what could be the oldest and largest network of cave passages ever discovered. These adventures will drop hundreds of feet into the Earth's core and explore the unknown. Straddling the equator, Borneo is an island of mountains, steep valleys, swamps, and dense rainforests. Millions of years of evolution, uninterrupted by major climatic changes, has created what may be the most diverse and complex forest on Earth, with 7,000 varieties of trees alone. The lush ecosystem is maintained by constant rain, humidity, and temperatures that never veer far from 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The topography of the island is diverse, from 13,000 foot peaks to the coastal swamplands to the second largest limestone rock formations in the world. Centuries of rainfall have carved fissures into the massive limestone structures, creating the deepest and largest unexplored cave passages on the planet. John Lane is the expedition leader of the subterranean explorers. In 1995, the explorers were the first American caving team to document the caves in Borneo. The government has invited them back to continue surveying the caves and jungle of the Ganung Buddha region. The explorers hope to use their findings to convince the government to preserve the land and turn it into a national park. I felt pretty good after I got, well, right when I got stunned. Man. Todd Burks and John Lane are co-founders of the Subterranean Explorers. Both are experienced climbers and cavers. It just started multiplying, like it could watch all the hives start appearing on my arm. And it just took out on a wave through my arm, across my chest, across all my legs. We should have just a group discussion on what to do. Like you yesterday, you took your epi, you felt better because it cleared all your receptor sites. Ralph Cutter is the base camp paramedic. Yeah, what what you? They don't smell through their nose, they smell with their tongue. In addition to being the most medically experienced member on the team, he is a herpetologist and ichthyologist, studying the reptiles and insects of the land. Many of the cave sites are a two-day hike from base camp. Caves in Borneo are unprecedented in that most of the trends of these caves start at the ground level and they work their way up rather than at starting at the ground level and dropping down into pits and dropping into the earth like most people would think of a cave. And the techniques here have lended themselves to the climber very well. We have a lot of, when, when, the, going, when the going gets tough, when there appears to be no more leads trending with the water going down or with finger passages going off to the right and to the left, it's oftentimes that you have to do an up climb. Very steep, very precarious rock, lots of mud in these caves. Big snake to your left. Yes. 
caves here in Borneo, they really, um, they're really unpredictable. You go in, you just can't really, can't tell exactly what's going on or where you're going to be. You can't tell entirely where the trending passages are. You go in the cave and you think that there's no other rooms or adjoining passages. For me, to go in those caves and to know that they're unpredictable is, has a lot of allure and is very adventuresome for me because I know that if I concentrate on the walls and keep moving around, I can see the changing shades of light that might reveal a passage here and there into a new area. When I enter a cave and I see what's been found so far, I know that we are just on the tip of the iceberg. And every little lead, every little hole needs to be checked because caves are not, not very revealing at all. You have to earn it, you have to work for it. Ever since I was a kid, I used to always sit around and just draw, draw, draw things all the time. And I would always draw caves in general. I'd sketch all these chambers, underground chambers that led to jewels and whatnot. This is when I was like five or six years old. All these images. Suddenly here I was, 28 years old, and I was living some sort of a youthful dream, going into these caves now, these real caves, and actually drawing, not jewels, but rather formations and waterways and whatnot, and question marks leading to new chambers, and it was just this whole trip just feels so much like everything I've ever lived for, everything I ever wanted. It's almost like walking on the moon, I think. Being in a cave is like walking on the moon. Nobody's been there, it's unexplored, but it's on this earth, you know, and, and uh, it's just the last bastion of unspoiledness. It's like reading the first paragraph of a book and getting just so hooked on the book that you can't put it down, you know, that's how I felt, you know, just, this is incredible. Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, and that's just how the push is. It's like you can't put it down, you gotta just keep going. I think once I get in the caves, I realize it's just a, it's a whole other element that's, I just feel so, so much at home and um, it's, I just have a smile that comes on my face the moment I enter a cave and as I'm traveling through the cave, I'm, I'm just ecstatic about the environment. Right, on go. The task that we were asked to do included surveying and finding new caves. That's, that was our, almost our primary goal. I think I had pretty clear expectations of what what was asked of me, and that was just to push it for four weeks while everyone's here. To increase the amount of caves here uh, increases the possibilities that this place becomes a national park. On this expedition, 14 cavers faced the enormous task of exploring a region that encompasses 300 square miles. Running on pure adrenaline, they work around the clock charting new underground passages. We had a large pit, a channel fissure that was dropping down into uh, some void that was unknown to us as to where it was going. Uh, Good go. And set. Down the hole. And we threw the rope down, not even knowing whether the rope would reach the very bottom. And so on. <laughs> put on our rail devices and started to lower down and um, just the uncertainty of what was down below was one of the most thrilling aspects of caving um, not knowing what alien might even live down there what torrents of, of bats and swiftlets might storm about you what unstable ledge you might arrive at not even knowing whether the rope would even reach Suddenly there's this black void hanging below you. Woo! And you know, all you're thinking of is the fact that you tied a knot at the end of that rope and you know that, well, you won't repel off the rope, but uh, you keep going down and you fight all your negativism.
get down to the ground and you're, uh, you realize no one else has ever stepped here before and you're not sure what you'll find and you're a little nervous to get off rope because you think you might be on a false floor and the whole thing could suddenly give away. So you just kind of sort of stand there in awe and stare about this huge new room. And your buddy up above is yelling down, what is it? How big is it? Does it go? What do you see? You sort of hesitate and you say, it goes. <laughs> it's great. Woo! Documentation of caves is always something that should be left to, uh, to surveying, um, but never publishing the location of the caves. Um, and here we are now telling the whole world about Phnom Buddha and where it is. And to me, it's a, it's a desperate attempt to save this area that, that uh, is just a paradise. Caving is not so much just adventurism and joy seeking, but saving, saving an, an environment that so many people know nothing about that uh, is seemingly invisible because it's under the underworld. Performing their daily ritual, the clouds begin to darken and churn. The sky opens, bathing the jungle with yet another downpour. Base camp is a makeshift open air longhouse tent, nicknamed Camp Cholera. Usual afternoon shower, actually very unpredictable, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the evening, but today I decided to go in the afternoon and just jumping. I am definitely learning things about group dynamics. It seems after a certain period of time, you get certain reactions from people. If you can get along with people for a period of time over two weeks, then you're an asset. It doesn't really matter if you can, uh, if you're a very good caver, if you're a very good climber, if you're a very good insect collector. It's hard to deal with the rain, the heat, the bugs, but there are the realities, which is, which is the rain and the bugs and the heat and humidity. And not being able to wash your clothes, at least not without effort. If you want to wash a t-shirt and shorts, then it's going to take you a couple hours. If you don't wash them, they mildew, they rot, they literally fall off of your body. And the bees are absolutely horrendous. This can be the most incredible experience a person has ever had, or it can be a miserable experience. Here's what happens when you lose your footing hiking here. Laceration of the back of my leg. And the bummer it was is that we were doing a jungle camp. I was about three and a half hours from the road, and when I got to the road, it was another four hours to town, so about seven and a half hours later. Um, I've been cleansing it about five times a day. I have uh, on some antibiotics. I, I pride myself on the number of cuts and uh, red marks I have on my feet. And right now, this, this probably doesn't look too good. The itching, the bites, the scratches, the stings, it's part of the adventure. You know, I was keeping a tally. You know, the tally was, you know, how many bee stings I got to the amount of bees that I killed. And I was up to 12 bee stings in three days for only killing four bees. And so they were definitely winning and, and I was losing. <laughs> One of the best part of the expeditions here was the cooking. You know, normally when we go out on expedition, you think you're going to be eating freeze-dried food or rice or, you know, something really simple. But coming here, it's a smorgasbord of Southeast Asian food where one night we have curry and the next night we have roasted chicken and different types of fish and barbecued meats and so forth. So he's, he's a good cook. Dinner? Yeah. Whew. Wow. It's still alive. Yeah. See you later. Bye. 
dinner seems to be on its way home. Caves are, are mysterious places. You can't perceive what you have until you can stand away and look at it and see a grid work matrix of survey data that a team has generated. So you'll go into a cave and you'll just walk through it and you'll decide, okay, we've got a going passage here and how far can we stretch the tape? Well, the passage may have many constrictions that allow you only to go so far because each instrument has to be viewed from station to station. One of the devices we use in the cave is the uh, clinometer. It's a small little measuring device that's used to measure the slope and the changing directions of the passage. One of the other instruments that we use is the compass. The compass gives you an idea of the rotations um, about you um, relative to north. Those two instruments combined with a tape measure create a three-dimensional wireframe of what exactly is the cave. There's a survey book that collects all the data. And that role is usually assigned to a person called a, a sketcher, the one that sits down and actually draws the cave passage relative to those survey points. 15.70. It's very important that the sketcher depicts the passage to the best of his estimations and that he is patient enough to write in the survey declination, the clinometer readings and the compass readings accurately so that it can then be read and entered into the computer. Once we enter those numbers into our laptops, we can then process that data and create a visual grid work of the passage we found that day or, or uh, the ongoing survey process. We can rotate this three-dimensional representation of the cave about and